So what is rapamycin? So rapamycin is a drug that um, is a naturally occurring uh, anti- fungal agent made by a bacteria that was discovered on Easter Island uh, back in the 1960s. Otherwise known as Rapa Nui. Right. Rapa Nui is the correct name for Easter Island and the bacteria Streptomyces hydroscopicus, which was discovered there by a group of explorers. um, Explorers is maybe the wrong word, but people doing sort of medical prospecting. uh, A group from Montreal, I believe, in 1966, they took a bunch of soil and dirt back from Rapa Nui to the lab in Montreal, where it sort of sat there unattended to for about five years. Uh, A chemist, a very astute chemist by the name of Seren Segal. Great name. Yeah. He started mucking around. Related to Steven Segal? No. (laughs) Different. and no ponytail, fortunately. <laughs> um, so Seren did some really interesting chemistry, isolated the compound, and noticed it had these really remarkable properties, which was it was the most potent antifungal agent he had ever seen, or the world had ever seen, frankly. Um, at the time, uh, as his son Ajit tells the story, um, who I've gotten to know a little bit, he felt he had basically come onto the biggest blockbuster, blockbuster cure, cure for athlete's foot the world was ever going to know. And right about that time, the company he worked for closed its Montreal headquarters, actually laid many people off, ordered the destruction of all non-viable compounds, and shipped him off to New Jersey um, in one of the greatest acts of scientific fortuity he did not follow orders <laughs> and he instead stuck said rapamycin into a little mini freezer that he and his family transported to their new home in new jersey they kept it in the freezer for many years until ultimately um, another drug company purchased the company he worked for and the new management said hey anybody working on anything interesting he said i'm, I'm working on this thing interesting that i haven't looked at in a few years and they said bring it out it must have been an interesting uh lawyer conversation <laughs> <laughs> based on the not following orders yeah. continue yeah so out came uh rapamycin which he named uh mycin cool. and you know mycin is typically the uh the prefix the suffix i guess that we use or what's the what's the second part of a word suffix. called suffix yeah for for antimicrobial agents and of course rapa is a tribute to the rapa nui like it, azithromycin. Correct. Yeah. So it it quickly became clear that this had remarkable anti-proliferative properties. So it could stop things from proliferating. So that was obviously a big Not part of Not just fungi. Right. Exactly. And in particular, um, it was very effective at making a certain type of lymphocyte, which is a white type of white blood cell, not proliferate. And it then basically went down the path. Eventually, Pfizer then bought Amaris, which was the company that bought his previous company, whose name I don't even remember at this point. Um, Pfizer ended up pursuing this, and it was FDA approved in 1999 for treatment of organ transplantation. So patients that have an organ transplanted have to be put on a really heavy regimen of drugs to suppress a part of their immune system called the cellular immune system that will attack a foreign organ. That's, what is that called? Host graft? No. No, graft versus host graft versus is host. actually when the organ, usually it's in the case of lymphoma or leukemia, when someone has a bone marrow transplant and the the graft, what they've been transplanted, attacks the host. Uh, I see. Yeah, I yeah. See. This right. is this is really host versus graft, but yeah, we don't usually call graft. it that. Yeah, but traditional sort of, you know, rejection. And actually, I did a really cool podcast on the topic of organ transplantation history with a guy named Chris Sonnenday. And it's, I mean, I know this subject well, but having a discussion with Chris really opened my eyes to just what a beautiful story it is and what the big breakthroughs were with drug development and how, you know, at one point it was like all you could give people was prednisone and you couldn't save anybody. And then, you know, you had other drugs like cyclosporin that were introduced, but then you get into this third generation of amazing drugs like rapamycin that took organ, uh, you know, preservation to a to a higher level now you're not swapping kidneys how do you know well at least not since the last time you sold one (laughs) in uh tijuana (laughs) settle a bet but uh why would you take rapamycin i know i'm skipping ahead a little bit well let's yeah so let's skip ahead so so 99 this drug comes on the market for um for for organ rejection and about 12 years later, a study gets published by Rich Miller, Randy Strong, and colleagues 
as part of what's called the Interventions Testing Program or the ITP, which is an amazing NIH funded program that tests molecules that um, are believed to have a shot at enhancing longevity. And it does so in a really, really rigorous way, probably the most rigorous way we can test small animals. Um, I've interviewed Rich Miller as well, it, probably one of my five favorite podcasts in terms of like nerding out on all of the molecules that can potentially impra- impact longevity. And rapamycin was in many ways the poster child for the ITP program because, um, first of all, it's hard to get anything to live longer. Um, second of all, when they were making the formulation for the rapamycin to feed the mice, and these were very special mice. These were not your typical crappy lab mice <laughs> that have no bearing whatsoever to real animals. These are a very special type of mice that are much more akin to real animals. And that's a very important distinction between what happens in 99% of mouse research, which is almost inapplicable to humans. And it's why so many drugs that get tested in these, you know, B6 mice and things like that, you know, show some marker of success and they become wild failures beyond the mice. But this was different. They had trouble getting the formulation to work. And by the time they finally did, the mice were like 20 months old, which means they're almost at the end of their life. They're like 70 year old, 65 year old mice. And they contemplated just scrapping the experiment, but they were like, ah, eh, screw it. Let's just run it late. So they started feeding the treatment group with rapamycin and the placebo group get to continue eating their regular chow. Okay. So it was oral administration. Yes. It was the rapamycin was mixed into their chow. And Lo and behold, the rapamycin group, despite initiating treatment so late in life, had a staggering improvement in lifespan. Um, there's been so many ITPs that have replicated this, I don't wanna misquote it, but it's something to the effect of like a 17 or 19% improvement in the males, uh, or in the females, and 11 to 12% in the males. And remember, the ITP uses a very rigorous way of assessing this, which is they're taking a look at the remaining life. Uh, or sorry, they're taking a look at total life, not just remaining life. So it's a it's it's an even higher bar to clear what how much lifespan elongation happens. They of course immediately went and repeated the study, administering the dose when they were younger, and saw an even greater response. This has been repeated over and over and over again. Um, and to my knowledge, there is not a single animal study that has tested this hypothesis that has not found oh, this yep. result. Oh, that's wild. Um, which again is very unusual. Yeah. So it's, it's just replicated over and over and over. It's and replicated over. nonstop. Uh, what is also interesting is when looking at other markers, other interesting things such as vision and hearing and other markers of health span, we continue to see improvements in these things for animals as well. And as I think we even spoke about before, a guy named Matt Caberline, who I'm uh, just interviewed for a second time for the podcast, um, has been studying this in companion dogs and looking at heart function. Because as you know, basically two things kill companion dogs, primarily heart failure and cancer. And so the question is, what would you be able to do to mitigate um, especially heart failure, congestive heart failure in dogs, especially large dogs, which are more susceptible to this. Um, and again, the, the, the results, though the research is limited because there's not an enormous interest in funding this research and it's expensive to fund research in dogs that live so long. Um, it, it's all pointing in the same direction. So when you contrast metformin and rapamycin, you have the opposite thing, right? In metformin, we have tons of human data that are not randomized, but are suggesting in cohorts that metformin is also protective, uh, but in a subset of people that have diabetes. So it's not as clear how protective metformin will be in, in people that do not. In the ITP, metformin did not succeed. In other words, metformin did not extend uh, life in the mice when given alone. When it was given with rapamycin, it did, but you could argue that was all the rapamycin. Um, I'm more bullish on Rapa simply because I'm, you know, I've been taking it now for three years outside of- and get, you can hear dog whistles. <laughs> <laughs> um, outside of, um, you know, the aphthous ulcers, which are the most annoying side effect of them. Those that are those little- Mouth ulcers. Yeah, the little mouth sores you like get. Like a canker sore. Yep. Yeah. Um, which you don't get, I don't get them de novo, but if I, like if one of my kids headbutts me, which 
they do at a, an alarming frequency. Um, and my, if I break a piece of my gum, like it's going to be an aphthous ulcer. Mm. Although what I, is it called again? Aphthous ulcer. Aphthous. Yeah. A P H T H O S. Whew. Yeah. Yeah. Nasty. Nasty. It doesn't sound fun. Um, so that's the only, is that the only documented in healthy normals? I, I don't know who has, is, would fund this research if anyone would, um, or I don't know what, I guess I don't even know what the measurements, the metrics would be, but. Well, that gets to the problem. We yeah. don't have a meaningful biomarker of aging. Yeah. I mean, that's full stop. The biggest problem in aging research today, hands down, nothing else matters. Yeah. When you don't have a really good biomarker for aging, we're sort of sitting around twiddling our thumbs, pontificating, doing studies that look at things that aren't that interesting or things that are interesting, but are like, you know, first order, second order, you know, but we just, we can't see the whole polynomial, right? Like if you think back to like yep. what a Taylor series is in calculus, if you're trying to use a polynomial to estimate sine X, the first order term is X equals Y. Like yep. that's interesting for about that much. But you know, when you really want to know x minus x cubed over three factorial plus x to the five over five factorial like when you want to really start figuring out the shape of this thing you've got to you're just going to need better tools 